When I started my PhD, um, and before that I have a master's in early childhood, I actually learned about how the brain works and how our experiences as children shape us for life. Becoming a woman, an adult, and starting to really live in the real world, I realized that a lot of experiences from my childhood had shaped who I am. Some of them positively, but some of them negatively. One big thing in my culture is hair. And I really want to talk about it because I learned by talking with friends, colleagues, and family members that my experience is not unique, but the trauma that comes with it, it's common. In many different cultures, a crown on top of a woman's head symbolizes status, wealth, and privilege. In modern times, another metaphor for crown is that one thing you can never take off, your hair. And that's why we have an old saying that goes, invest on your hair because it is the crown that you never take off. As a result, women around the world, some of them, are obsessed with the looks of their hair. They spend hours and a lot of money investing on their curls, their beautiful waves, styles, haircuts, colors, you name it. But have you ever wondered what flawless means for every individual? Who decides what flawless means? Society? Culture? The people around us? Unfortunately for me, I was born in the Dominican Republic, and in this particular aspect, a society that has a really negative concept when it comes to hair. This society in which I was born and raised also made the decision for me that my hair was bad and needed to be changed. Imagine, I was only nine years old, the first time my mother took me to a hair salon to fix my problem. I had a beautiful afro that I learned I inherited from my father. All of my African traits came from my Afro-Latino father. But somehow, this was a negative thing. Nobody told me that actually this beautiful traits came from Ethiopia. There was no talk about colonialism, royalty, roots, history. There was just a talk of, this is a problem, we're going to fix it for you. As a child, I was constantly walking around feeling it was my fault that my hair wasn't as the magazines or the people that were representing me and telling me who I wanted to be when I grew up. Instead of focusing on history and roots and the beauty, there was some sort of shame that came with having curly hair or an afro. And somehow, as a small child, I carried that shame with me everywhere I went. My family, friends, teachers, and everybody around me didn't hesitate to remind me constantly that there was something wrong with my hair. Remember, we particularly call curly hair bad. My bad hair was constantly a reminder that I needed to change, and I needed to change fast. As I grew older, I realized I wasn't alone in experiencing this. After speaking with family, friends, and people I got to know along the way, I realized that this is an experience that many girls go through. You see, learning about brain development told me something very important. The way we talk to children will shape them for life. So if you use hurtful words and negative words, children will grow up to become emotionally unhealthy adults. And guess what? Hurt people hurt people. With the journey of changing my appearance and becoming good and fixing my problem came hair relaxers, hot combs, flat irons, blow dry even daily, and creams and treatments to make sure my hair looked as straight as possible. As I thought back to my childhood, I tried to understand why was I so pressured and pushed to this agenda of fixing my bad hair. And then I thought of representation. The women I was looking up to all had straight, blonde, beautiful long hair. J-Lo, Shakira, Selena, Thalia, those were my idols growing up. But none of them looked like me. And the more I looked in magazines, TV shows, movies, there was never an Afro-Latina representing little girls who wanted to say yes to the hair that had nothing wrong. Growing up in poverty made me really crave success. 
But a part of me as a child thought that maybe success wasn't for me because most of the women who were successful and Latina looked nothing like me. As I went on to pursue my own dreams and my career, I did not start appreciating my curls until I was 19 years old and moved to New York City. Fresh off college, I signed up for a modeling agency and my heart stopped the first time my agent told me the client wanted me with curly hair. I arrived on set feeling extremely uncomfortable and out of my element. I thought everybody was looking at me on the train. I thought everybody was commenting and saying, oh, there goes the girl with the bad hair. On set, I met a wonderful hairstylist. This African-American woman took my big afro and turned it into a beautiful magazine postcard. I still, to this day, love those pictures. They were featured all over the media and in a national magazine. When I started doing my own research on this topic, I discovered that the most famous models modeling curly hair were mostly Dominican. But they were modeling for the European, Asian, and American market. In my country, they were not even known. And that started to be the case for me as well. In New York, everybody requested me with my afro. And then I started to fall in love with it. I started to have conversations and talk about my childhood and realize that nobody ever really told me, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Let me show you how it's done. My natural hair was incredible, but nobody from my family, my childhood, or my roots told me this ever. I ended up traveling to 30 different countries, designing curriculum, teaching children, and doing volunteer work. And in that experience was the moment in which I finally grew and healed. You see, in all of these countries, there were people who were fascinated with my curls. In China, I was kind of forced to leave my hair natural because there was no hair salon who understood what to do with my hair. It was really funny. Then as I started walking around with my hair just fresh out of the shower, people asked me to take pictures with me. Then some others asked me if it was a wig, and some others asked me if they, if they could touch my hair. It was incredible because that would never happen back home. In fact, if you walk around with an afro in my city, you would be told to go comb your hair. Going to China, people loved my hair. But then some of them told me that I should wash my skin better so I wouldn't be so dark. Then when I went to Europe, some people did love my hair but were not very fond of my curves. You see, Traveling to these places, meeting people and talking, I realized the standards of beauty for little girls and women go hand in hand with something is defective and you have to fix it. Says who? The more questions I asked to the people I met and became friends with, the more confused I felt. I started looking for answers about how I felt about myself in others and in different places and couldn't reach a final conclusion. The moment I understood that the answer was within myself, I found freedom. I decided to look back where it all started. My culture, that's where the root of the problem was. I spoke with a few girls who grew up with me and are from my generation. And this is what they had to say about their experience. As a child, when did you start loving your hair? And it's okay if this never happened. I want you to tell me about that. I started loving, when I was a child, I started loving my hair when I straightened my hair. So after going to the hair salon, that's when I loved it. If I, I remember uh, more on my teenage years, I became so self-aware. I also used to play table tennis. And I remember going, uh, sometimes even skipping practice because I didn't want to sweat my hair right after going to the hair salon. And I wanted my hair to last maybe two days before I did my next round of sports because <laughs> it will just get a little bit curly, not even like the afro I have right now. It will just not be perfectly straight. And so I loved it whenever it looked spotless. As you can see, my struggles weren't unique, which I mentioned before. But what we do moving forward is what I want to focus on. Who is the one defining the beauty standards in society? Is it actually culture? Is it the individual? Is it the people around them? If it's actually the people around them and society, then why was I pressured to disguise my curls as a child? 
If it was myself, then I probably would have made a different decision. And finally, if everybody had this view of how I was supposed to look, how come everybody viewed me so different in 30 different countries? All of these questions were very important until I was able to reach my final answer. And in my opinion, I don't think it's society or the people around you. None of those are the ones who define who you are and how you're supposed to look, really. The truth for myself was to find balance between society, culture, and people's opinions, and then find myself. You need to find balance in life. Anybody who is a Buddhist or believes in such sort of energy is going to tell you the same. And in fact, I believe that balance in everything is very important. And that's what helped me heal. Remember, we're talking about this whole process from childhood to adulthood and then going back so we can be emotionally healthy. That's the important part. As we are growing up, even from childhood, we are pressured by many different things in our lives. And it's up to us if we want to give in or if we want to fight back. We all have different personalities and we are going to react differently to different situations. So we need supportive, emotionally strong adults behind us helping us be the best versions of ourselves. Why would you give in to give up individuality? Why would you give up into being yourself because somebody else is telling you you shouldn't? These are thought-provoking questions we need to have with our children. I think that perhaps what we need is a culture that empowers every individual that is within it. It's a culture that tells you that you can reach your maximum potential no matter where you come from, how you look like. You're not defective. There is something amazing within each and every one of us, and it's our job as family members, as friends, as people in that society to help people find themselves. That's how we grow. That's how we become better. You want a better world? Start with the children. You want a better world? Start with the people around you. We all need one another. And to go back to my crown example, it's not about the material. It's not about how many diamonds, the gold, or anything that your crown possesses. What defines a ruler is who they are inside. A ruler who sees themselves as someone who can help others and love themselves the same way they love their society. That's the kind of culture I'm willing to embrace.